Hello, everybody. Welcome to this number 53. So, Gabriel, he's talking about my um, wedding anniversary. So, anyway, I hope you guys are doing well. Howdy. Any questions? There's ACAC. Howdy. Great to see you guys today. Yes, Gabriel, what do you got? <clears throat> okay, tongue position. He says, I play classical, and I try to play as open as I can for a big symphonic sound. When I go higher, I feel that my tongue moves too much and it's giving me a sound like twa twa that is not very appropriate. That's correct. Um, yeah, this is what my... So, just so you know, the last trumpet teacher I had, I had, I had seven long-term trumpet teachers and all the way up till I was about I don't know, like 27 years old. That's correct. He says it takes too much time to move from bottom to top of the mouth. And um, so my my last teacher was the, the second trumpet of the Houston Symphony. I think I took with him at least two years, and it might have been actually three years, and it was actually worth more than just two years because we had lessons every single week. This is one of the reasons why I try with my students to uh, encourage lessons every single week because that I know what that's like. I know how we how that how much that helped. But anyway, he used to call that Dalton D O W. Dow, like that. I'll, I'll type it out. Dow tongue. And, and it's exactly what you're describing there, where you're, you're trying to play on a mouth, uh, or on an oral cavity that's actually too big for the range that you're playing. And so here's the thing. Now, I took a lesson also with Armando Catala. Uh, maybe you might know that name, Armando Catala. I took one lesson with him. And so, and, and with him, he talked about what he called the operatic E. In other words, when, when an opera singer has a syllable of an E sound. They don't just go E, right? They don't put it all the way up in their mouth. 
right? But they do elevate the tongue uh, enough to get an E sound out of it, right? So he calls that the operatic E, a, a huge E sound. That's what he suggests playing for 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 the um, for the for the uh, for the trumpet, right? Is using an operatic E sound, and so now when you go higher than that, you have to have even a higher uh, tongue position. And the 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 problem with not having a higher tongue position is if you don't have a higher tongue position for the higher notes, then the um, now this is some. I, I this this doesn't a exactly answer your question um, because we're we're not there yet, right? But as you get to the to the higher notes, the the tongue position has to come deeper and deeper in, or higher and higher up in the mouth, so that you get much more of a shallow um, oral cavity, right? Now, when you tongue in that context. The tongue has to tongue where the tongue is, right? So if you're playing really, really high, let's say, let's say the fingers are the teeth. This is the the roof of your mouth. When you're playing low, and the oral cavity is real big, you can pull the tongue down and tongue like that. But if you're playing high and the oral cavity is small like that then you're going to only open up a little bit like that. You're not going to do this. Okay, so that's something that one of my students, I have an adult student in, in Tucson. That's something that he just learned this, this like two weeks ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. He was having the exact same problem. And it was causing, see, in classical music, what we want and this is, this is true whether you're talking about across the note or across the phrase or across the entire piece. We want a uniformity of sound. That's even, so uniformity of sound in classical music is even more important than how good your sound is. You can have a slightly inferior sound but sound quote unquote better than someone who has a superior tone quality, but doesn't have a um, consistent tone quality. So, so like what you're talking about when you get that dowel sound, um, that's going to interfere with a good classical um, performance. Right, so that's what we want is to have that that sonor that same sonority through from the beginning of the note to the end of the note, from one note to the next note, and from one phrase to the next phrase, from the beginning of your endurance to the end of your endurance. That's the trick in classical music. So, and and the thing is, is we have to have different tongue positions for different ranges because if we don't it offsets the balance on the on so like for example if if the tongue position is not high enough and you're trying to play a high note you're going to have to overcompensate with the lips or with too much air and of course you know a lot of times the reason why we don't want, the reason why we think we don't want that higher tongue position while we're playing the high notes is because we actually think that that gives you a bad sound, but it gives you a bad sound when you overdo it. And remember, the higher you go up, the more subtle everything becomes. The higher you go up, the more subtle the changes are from, from one uh, pitch to the another, right? To the other. So what that means is most people that bring their tongue arch up for the high notes and don't like the sound of it, 
It's because they did too much of it. They're trying to operate the same way you operate an octave lower, and it won't work like that. So anyway, that is, that's a very common thing. So the, the way you tongue like that is to just open it up and don't move. This is especially true also with the low notes. Because there's a lot of times when people on the low notes, they want to do this. And you'll get that dao, dao sound when you're playing on the low notes. So, yes, you want to have more control over your tongue so that it's not. And, you know, I was told the exact same thing. I think I talked about this maybe last week or the week before on this Q&A. How, how on uh, all my teachers, and I don't mean my, my um, college professors. I'm talking about the teachers I had earlier, beginners. My beginning teachers, my, my high school teachers, uh, they all said play as open as you can play. And that's just not true. That's what creates all this weirdness. Now, and, and you have to be, you have to be, um, you have to understand where they're coming from. It's because most students play the opposite way around, right? Most students play with their tongue too high. Most students play with their lips too tight. Um, and so they're telling them constantly open up, open up, open up because they've got a nasal sound. What the what the band directors didn't know back then, and a lot of them still today don't know, is that when the students open up too much, it creates an even worse nasal sound because they have to compensate by normally by making their lips too tight. All right. So that, I hope that answers your question. ACAC says, can you explain how to use faster air instead of more air for range expansions? Um, first of all, that's not a thing. That's a, so when people say faster air, what they're talking about, it's really a visualization Okay, the air isn't actually going faster. Okay, so and you know we're talking of that's kind of what we're talking about now. The example that lots of people will give you is that when you take a hose and put your thumb over the hose, the the water goes farther, right? Um, that's what we're doing when we're playing the high notes. So really, the whole faster air thing, now you have to have good support, right? You have to have good support. And when I say good support, I'm not looking for more or less. I'm looking for consistent. Okay? We're not looking for more air power, we're not looking for less air power, we're looking for consistent air power, okay? When you raise your tongue in your mouth, it's the same thing as putting your thumb over the hose. So as, the, as you go higher, the oral cavity gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's really what what they should be talking about. The whole concept of faster air is a, uh, I don't know. It's a way for people to get to think about stuff in a different way. I don't like that phrase at all. The faster air thing, it's not scientific and stuff that's not scientific, not scientifically sound. I don't like propagating that kind of language, right? So I'm not very, um, I don't like saying stuff that's not true, I guess is a better way to say it. <laughs> um, 
so maybe the air is coming out a little bit faster. That's not what's the the that's not the point, right? That's not how we play the horn. Okay. Um anyway, I hope that makes sense. Any other questions? Looks like this one might be a short one. <laughs> so this was an experiment. I tried uh posting the video last night instead of today. And I didn't know how that would work out. Um, okay, so that's a good question, ACAC. AC. How do you get more consistency in tone? Usually consistency, consistency in tone is consistency in your body movements, okay? So the su support has to be consistent, all right? So like some of the people, so let me see. So yes, the, the Gabriel says it, it's also resistance, isn't it? Yes. So, so the, 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 when you change any of this stuff, the tone changes, right? You can, even the slightest changes, you know, this is almost, playing trumpet right is almost like uh, Tai Chi. I've never done Tai Chi, but I've had Tai Chi students before, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost Tai Chi because you have to be so still. You have to be so still. When you're, let's, let's go from the support up, right? The support cannot be interrupted any way. So these guys that bounce their leg like that, they're actually causing a wobble in their tone. It might, it might not be perceptible until you look on the screen for the recording and you see a, a bounce on the recording. That's the nice thing about digital recording, right? You can, you can actually see all this stuff, right? So anything that affects the, the torso, will affect the the quality of the sound. So that includes shifting in your chair. That includes side-to-side -side movement. Now, some people will say, well, Mr. Lewis, how can people march down? Well, that's from the legs down, isn't it? If you're marching correctly, that's from the legs down. That's why they do core style marching so that there's no bounce on the torso. So the, if anything you do to the torso will, will make your sound change. Then we have the, the oral cavity. Anything you do with the oral cavity, any changes you make while you're playing will make changes in the sound. So that includes um, it includes stuff that you you might do to get from one note to another, like what we're talking about now with the dowel sound, right? Um, it includes, um, I mean, so let's we can just make a blanket statement. Anything you do here, moving your jaw, moving your tongue. Um, opening or closing your throat. You know, a lot of people have, if they're not supporting right, a lot of people will um, open and close the glottis. <laughs> and they'll, they'll have that little, little grunt sound inside their throat when they're playing. All right, we don't want that because it changes the sound. And then... So we, we, we talked about the torso has to be completely still. We talked about the, the throat and the oral cavity has to be completely still, except for when you're changing notes, right? Um, and then the, the embouchure has to be still. You hit the note, and then when, when you hit that note, you hold it completely still. And we don't think of it that way, right? We think of it in terms of pitch. You, so when you're switching pitch, uh, and by the way, this is why the lip buzz and the 
the mouthpiece buzz are so important because you're the whole point of the lip buzz and the mouthpiece buzz is to get as close to real notes as you can. So if you if you're gonna lip buzz may had a little lamb. Right? Um, you can't slide into the notes like that. You want to have very clean one note to the next. Right? Not my best lip buzz ever, but you get the idea, I hope. We don't want to slide around. So, um... When you're doing mouthpiece buzz and lip buzz, that sliding becomes extremely obvious. That's why all the, also, you know, you hear people that like to do, quote unquote, the sirens, right? <laughs> they do that as part of their warm up. I'm not a big fan of that because we don't want that when we're playing. Okay, now the last thing with the, the consistency of the sound is you don't want anything to bump the horn. And that includes, that's why your third slide should be as easy as this. Because if you're trying to move so hard to get the slides to operate right or get the valves to operate right, your sound is not going to be consistent. Okay, so all of that stuff goes into what it takes to have a consistent sound. You don't want any movement from any of that stuff. And that's the more, the higher you go, the more true that becomes. Because the higher notes are more sensitive to this movement than the lower notes are. Um, what would you, what would you mouthpiece buzz? And would you do it at the beginning of your routine? So, I'd like to do expansion stuff with the, the, the mouthpiece buzz. So I start in the middle of the range and I go up and then I go down and I go up a little bit more and then I go down a little bit more. That's basically what I do. All of my routine books have that stuff in it. That's built into the routines. And yes, it's at the beginning of the routine. Um, you'll, all of them. Um, Daily Routines book, the Chops Express book, and all of the Chops, uh, uh, Trumpet Chops books have that same pattern for the for the, the lip buzz and the mouthpiece buzz. Anyway, I hope that all makes sense. Any other questions? So mostly when I'm doing lip buzz or mouthpiece buzz, it's, I try to do scales first. Actually, the scales are harder than the, the arpeggios. People think that the arpeggios are hard, but they're only hard because you have to hear them, right? Once you can hear them, they're not hard. They're actually easier than the, than the scales. The scales are hard because the notes are so close to each other. Gabriel says, what do you think about circular breathing? You know... I can do it. I don't like it. Um, I'm not a much of a person for gimmicks, and it really is a gimmick, right? So there's times when I've used it because I had to use it. Let's say you're in a recording session, and they really want that last note to be long, and you've just played a long phrase going into the last note. And, and I know that's a very simplistic way of using it you know the, the guys that can really use it and and i've done some of this they can they can play a phrase and, and breathe while they're still playing a phrase um but i really don't think that is that there's much value in it at all it's it's more of a gimmick people see that you went a long time without breathing and they go, oh. but to me that's not what music is music is not so you have to understand, right? 
that there's different kinds of trumpet player. And so like an artist and an entertainer are not the same thing. And you, uh, you know how we can look at personality part, uh, aspects, right? Well, I see trumpet players on this spectrum. You have entertainers on this side and artists on this side. And yes, you can have someone that's like 70% entertainer and 30% artist. So I'm not saying that we're all one extreme or the other. Um, but me personally, I'm way, way on the artist side. I don't like gimmicks. I don't like stuff that basically entertains people. Um, I will do that, uh, do that when I'm paid to do that. So, for example, like the dancing, I dance when I'm getting paid to dance, stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, I put that in that category. It's an entertainment gig gimmick that the audience loves but isn't really very artistic. And, and why is it not artist artistic, okay? Let, let's be clear about that. The reason it's not artistic is because what is art in the first place? Musical art is a reflection of what's natural in our everyday life, right? Musical art is, is a, so in other words, it's another way to speak and we would never actually speak that way. Now I know that there are some forms of art and it's becoming more and more popular today. I'm not a very big fan of it. More and more kinds of music that is more sound oriented and less melody oriented. oriented. Um, like I heard a, 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 a band piece the other day that's supposed to sound like traffic noise. Now, it's amazing that someone can write a composition that actually does sound like traffic noise in the city. Uh, that's, that's an amazing feat. But that falls more on the entertainment side as far as I'm concerned. It's not something that's going to soothe you the way the way true artistic expression, I don't know, maybe I'm um, way off there. Um, to me, if, it, if it's not melodic, it's not really that human. So I don't have a lot of interest in that. ACAC -AC says, can you play chromatic from C to G above the staff? Can I play chromatic from C to G above the staff? So that is harder. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Are you asking me to play that right now? Um, Gabriel says, I tried a lot of times and I was never able to do it. Yeah, you know what? I Personally, I don't think it's worth the time. I did it because I thought I needed to, back in those days when I was doing everything, right? Every If it was trumpet related, I thought I had to do it. That's, yeah, I know that, talking about circular breathing. Um, I thought I had to do it because it was something trumpet players did. Um, I, so I, I learned how to do that in my 20s. Yeah, it's not something I'm actually right. I know, not the scale. I guess I can try to do that. I'm not really that warmed up. So the thing is, this horn doesn't resonate like that. Because this is such a huge horn, the slot in those notes is very um, 
with I like the word squirrely, the word squirrely. Um, but yeah, that's so you understand that once you get past high C, all of the notes are all um connected, right? So you don't you don't have the fingerings are actually just there. Oh, that's oh, that's right. You told us that last week, Gabriel. So I have a seventy-two. The difference is that the seventy-two that they sell. If you, I I had to have this made because I can't play on a medium large bore. <laughs> AC AC says I meant C below this staff to G. <laughs> There I was, like, showing off. Okay. So why? Okay. I want too high. What am I doing? Anyway. Okay, yes. So, yeah, mine's large boy. Is yours large boy? So, yeah, it's really weird to, to stop on the G, I think. I don't remember ever stopping on G when I'm playing chromatic. Okay, wow. So, you've got the exact same horn as me except for the the, the silver. That's great. I love this horn. This is the best trumpet play, trumpet that I've ever played. This is by far the best trumpet I've ever played. And it's... And the reason it's so wonderful is because I can sound whatever I need to sound like on any gig. It's a little more difficult. Oh, okay. Your main horn is a... I would love to have one of those rotary horns. Yeah. So, um, so yes, this horn, even though, so on the high notes, it's a little bit harder to control. It's squirrely on the high notes. But if you have as your priority the style and, and you know, because when I'm playing those high notes, it's usually like on a salsa gig or on a top 40 gig. Um, and... I just have more flexibility on this horn, flexibility in, in context of what sound I can have. I can have the appropriate sound for this and the appropriate for, sound for that. And um, I've never had a horn that was this appropriate on so many different gigs. So it's it really is my favorite horn. Um, I have the other horn that I like a lot because it's got my sound, right? The the the, the pudgy has my sound. Um, <laughs> but even though I say that's my sound, right? I play it and I'm like, that's almost too much my sound, <laughs> right? It's it's just not appropriate for all of the stuff. I have a video coming out on Sunday that's got the pudgy on it, and I love it, but it's just not appropriate for everything I do. AC AC says, I look forward to buying a box stride 50th anniversary edition. Okay, next year. I would love to get it customized, but how would I go about that? Yeah, I'm not really the person to ask that because I'm not um I'm not that big into the, the equipment stuff. I've never really had the money to 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 spend on that. Santo Domingo, hello. Um Hi, Mr. Lewis. Hope you are fine. Yes, I am. Thank you. I have a curiosity about what's the point why student horns have adjustable third slide ring while professional horns have... Desis. Okay. Um...
So, um, still trying to understand this question. Let me see. I have a curious. What, what's the point why student horns have adjustable third slide ring, while professional have? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so. I'm not a big fan of, let's just say it this way, I'm not a big fan of student horns at all. I think you're much better off buying a used pro horn. The student horns are made out of terrible, uh, ter terrible, what do you call it, uh, materials. And there's nothing wrong. There's so many great used horns out there that you can get for the price of a, um, a for the price of a, a student horn. I'm just not. I just don't want my students buying unless they want something that's like real shiny. If that matters to them. Um, so I see that you're talking about the third, third slide. Maybe you're asking about the pro ones having both. Now, this is only a modern, a, a, a modern thing. A lot of this, a lot of the old pro horns didn't have slides at all. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Gabriel, you're right. Bach is a factory trumpet now, and that's why I'm a little concerned. That's why I haven't just bought a replacement for this. This one, I'm beating it up. It, it, it's seen so many, many, many hours of, of gigs and practice time, and um, it is getting worn out. So, Santo Domingo, if you can clarify your question a little bit more, um, because I, I don't see what exactly what you're saying here, so I don't mind... Um, Clarifying, if you clarify, I don't mind answering. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there's a bunch of good uh, custom horn makers. Um, Harrelson is a good one. Um, Yeah, so that, that would be because that's such a huge horn. <laughs> Gabriel says, I love my Bach, but it exhausts me. It's a, it's a huge horn. The bell is huge. The And if you've got large bore, then then the whole horn is, is just huge. Um, and it does, you, you do have. Now, here's the thing is... Once you grow into that endurance, everything else you play is going to feel easier. That's a nice, a nice thing about it. Okay, yeah, I guess it is heavy. All right, any other questions? Right, heavy to hold. Any other questions? All right, maybe we're done. I'll give you guys a few more seconds. Oh, here's something. I'm not really knowledgeable about bore size, but I believe my trumpet has a large one. Can you tell me what size bore the box strad is. So the box strad comes in different bore sizes. So um so yeah the box strad comes in in whatever bore size that you you have. Most common is either medium large or large, but I I believe they've even got small bore too. Is in jazz the Dao Dao acceptable? I think in jazz it's a lot more acceptable. Let's put it that way. I think in jazz we want to in in jazz we want the sound to change on the note. It's the opposite. 
if you play with that classical clean sound across the whole, the, across the note, across the phrase, across everything, it sounds like somebody classical trying to play jazz. So if that would be totally unacceptable in classical music, right? Maybe look it up on your AC. AC says maybe look it up on your computer and tell me. <laughs> no, <laughs> just type in Bach 50th anniversary. No, that's what I'm saying, man. <laughs> you can get the anniversary Bach in whatever board you want if you're ordering it. Okay, otherwise, you have to. Find one that has a board that you have. The the size of the board should be impressed on the valve. That's correct. It's the where the where the um size is is on. Oh, <laughs> my finger was covering it. Right here. That's the size. That's the L for large. Okay. Um, Richard, hello, Richard. I've bought an Adams A1 Generation 2, and I really love that horn. That sounds cool. I'm not familiar with Adams at all. That's, I think maybe I tried the Adams. Yeah, the Buck Loyalist website has stuff like that. Um... Yeah, the, I think I might have tried the Adams when I was at the ITG conference when it was in San Antonio. There's a lot of great horns out there. All right, any more questions? You know, the thing about these... these um. What's really nice, and, and this might be why more classical players aren't using them, what's really nice with, the, with, with these um, custom makers, and there's so many of them now, is that you can have the, the horn that's actually perfectly aligned with your personality, your, your musical personality. You can have the horn that's perfectly aligned with that personality. It's not necessarily the horn you should be playing on. Like if you're, um, if you have commitments to other people and you're not a hundred percent artist, right? What is an artist? An artist is somebody who goes up in public and expresses themselves, right? Express not that you don't ever not express yourself, but the um, to the degree that you're expressing yourself, it's all. Um, you have absolute control of, over av every aspect. But if you're like in a top 40 band, that's probably, it's quite possible that the horn that expresses who you are would not work for that band. Or if you're in a concert band or a symphony orchestra or something like that, it is quite possible that the horn that, that most fits your personality is not appropriate for that band. And that's something I already knew when I bought my pudgy, and I even told them. I think maybe he was offended by what I said, but I don't. I don't. I'm not one of those guys that can temper the truth just because people are offended, right? And that probably is a character flaw, <laughs> right? But um, it's true that horn. It, that's why my compliment sounds so left-handed, right? is people get offended because I'm, I'm in the process of, of complimenting the horn, saying this horn has my personality. And then I said, I probably couldn't play it on most of my gigs. 
but I want this horn because it, this horn has me all over it, right? And I think people get offended by that. And I don't, I don't have like the social skills to temper that kind of stuff. You know, I don't, I, <laughs> and I wish people could like understand that I'm complimenting them. They made a horn that like that out of every horn in the world, this horn fits my personality. Right. Um, <laughs> but I don't think people see it that way. What's it like to play in a big band? Do players have some sort of creative input or you have to listen to the conductor? It's not the conductor that you listen to in a big band. You listen to the first trumpet player. So we try, imagine a the Blue Angels, right? And I'm sure other countries have similar, right? Imagine the Blue Angels, you got five or six or seven, I think it's five, five rockets flying in tandem, right? And they, they do all this stuff, and it's it's perfection, right? That's what we try to do in a big band is we try to play as one unit. Now, here's the beauty of the big band is that you can have, within that structure, you can have your own style. This is not so true with other kinds of music. Like, what? Well, that's. Let me be clear about that. It's not so true with with classical music. With classical music, you need to follow more of a strict um, conformity, right? But no, we we listen to to the lead player. Now, if you have some inflection that you want to put into your part, you can do that, and it actually makes the the overall sound more interesting. I think that's why bands like Duke Ellington and Count Basie sounded the way they sounded is because each of the individuals were free to be individual as long as they were flying like the, the, the Blue Angels. In the orchestra and some of the other big bands where, where everything is about more more greater levels of conformity, you don't have that organic richness that you have with with um, Basie and bands like that. And I, I got to hear several bands. My theory is that El Paso, back in the days when people didn't fly everywhere, El Paso was like the only place you could stop on I-10 between Phoenix and, and Tucson, that area, and um, San Antonio. Those other small towns would not really be the kind of places that would have a big band. And so a lot of times I think, this is my theory, I don't know this for sure, I think we were getting to hear these big bands because they probably needed some place to play that night and probably gave El Paso much better deals than they did other places because they needed to stay a night, having a gig one night um, because there just was too much time between those stops on I-10. That's my theory. And we got to hear some awesome, awesome bands. I got to hear Lionel Hampton. Um, and, and so there, there, there's a distinct difference between big bands that that sound that don't have that organic beauty to them and big bands that have like that that are more perfect right and i don't tend to like the ones that are more perfect i tend to like the ones on this side that are more expressive and 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 let some degree of personal expression happen even within those inner parts anyway that's my my take on this Gabriel says, I've heard that in some symphonic orchestras, they won't accept you if you don't play that horn and that mouthpiece. That is correct, but I think that's probably old news. I don't think it's like that today. I think it was like that in the 80s and the 90s. I think today people are... Uh, I think... Yeah, I don't know. Yes, I, I actually, you know what? I take it back. I think they're still like that. 
it's just I think that the 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 control they have is not necessary anymore. I guess that's what I'm saying. Is because there's so much conformity now, and it's because of supply and demand. There are so few jobs, and it creates a power imbalance. And that's why I wouldn't want that job to save my life, right? I wouldn't want that job at all. Because it's it's um it's over it's a job that's over glorified now because of supply and demand. There's not enough jobs and way, way, way too many people. Already in the 90s, they were already not taking applications after the fifth, 500th application. Already in the 90s. And in that time, since the 90s, the universities have been turning out more and more and more symphonic players. And during that time, the number of orchestras has gone down, not up. So it's there's a huge... And, and really, all of the music industry has become like that. There's a huge power... See ya, um, Richard. Thank you for hanging out with us. There's a huge power imbalance in that orchestra world right now. And it's not appealing to me whatsoever. It is not appealing to me. I love the music, but I love the music. Actually, you know what? I prefer the older recordings, to tell you the truth. Because you still have that richness. You still have that, that personality coming out in the music. And I think today everything is so commercially homogenized. That and it, and it's because they have to conform, or they don't get the gig, right? AC AC asks, "Have you ever wanted to play in an orchestra?" Yes, I have played in a professional orchestra. I played in school orchestras mostly, but I also had two years. I played two seasons in the El Paso Symphony Orchestra, and then I played various orchestra gigs I've played with the, uh, I played one time with the Houston Symphony <laughs> I, I'm you know when they called me for the Houston Symphony they said this is their this is what they told me they said we have somebody we call when we need someone to play improvising jazz and we have somebody we call when we need somebody to play lead trumpet, like the jazz stuff, right? But they needed someone that did both. And they said I was the first one that they thought about. So that's how I ended up on that one gig. Um, I don't think I did all that good on that gig, but um, they liked it. They said they liked it. I don't know. I, I'm, I get a little bit too... But you know what was cool about that is I got to play some of the classical stuff on that gig, like the overture. I played the overture, and um, John DeWitt was playing first. I was playing second. That was fun. I think that's how it was. I don't think I was playing first. I think John DeWitt played first on that, and then I played second. That was that was a blast to be in the, the Houston Symphony playing second <laughs> on one song at least, right? I was actually more, I was actually more thrilled to play second to John than I was to play lead on on the other stuff. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, do you still get nervous at gigs? No, not really. Uh, I it took me a long, long time to get over my nerve stuff. And I have a theory today about most students, why they get nervous. I think uh, a lot of it is the way they practice. It has nothing to do with how good they are. I think when you practice, see today we live in a world, um, today we, uh, this is, I'm, I'm gonna answer that question. Today we live in a world that is not stoic, 
Um, the the um, the emphasis is on passion, is on you know more emotional stuff. The emphasis is not on doing the right thing in today's world, right? In our society today, it's not about doing what works. It's not. It's all about doing what you feel like, basically. What you have a passion for, what you what you love, right, and all that stuff, and um, I believe that approach to playing the trumpet is what makes people nervous because they can't get on stage and just play. And so, and how does that happen? You let's say you're practicing at home and you're serious, right? That's the thing, right? If you're if you're going to be a great trumpet player, you're serious, and 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 your band director tells you you better get serious about this, and and you get serious, right? It's like all emotional. The whole bit is all emotional. Oh, I'm serious. I'm serious now. Oh, and then when you make a mistake, and your band director says, "No, that's not acceptable." So you make a mistake, and you go, "Oh, oh, I made a mistake," because that's how you've been programmed to do now, right? Because everything in our life now is all about our emotion. How are you supposed to turn that off when you get on stage? I've talked about this before in this in these um, in these uh, 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 question answer sessions. You can't turn that off if that's how you practice. As a general rule, rule, what you do when you practice is what happens on stage. So the reason we're seeing so much of this kind of nervousness on stage is because that's how you're practicing. You're, uh, you're approaching your practice from an emotional perspective. The, the idea of getting serious about it is emotional and you're trying to you're trying to rev the emotions up so that you do a better job. How are you supposed to rev the emotions back down when you get on stage? You can't do that. It's not possible. That's why people get uh, uh, stage fright now. I'm I'm convinced that 80% of the time, when people have stage fright, this is what's going on, is that they have, quote unquote, taken it so serious. And you can, and, and the way you know this is happening is when you make a mistake, you stomp your foot, you hit yourself, you, you let out a scream. Ah! If that's you when you're practicing, there's no way you can turn that off when you're on stage. You can't turn that off on stage. And basically, essentially, that's what nerves are. Is when you've lost control now. Your emotions are now controlling your body. And most of you, that's what's happening. And I'm not talking about... The older generations, the older generation wasn't raised this way. We were told, uh, you know, from my age and older, I guess, we were told that um, we were the ones that were told not to cry about stuff. Right? We were the ones that were told, <laughs> if you don't stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> right? We were the ones that told it didn't matter if you were bored. We were the ones that were told that um, um, if, you're, if it's boring, do it anyway. That's, that was our parents teaching us to control our emotions and not let our emotions control us. But this generation today is not being taught that. This generation today is being taught to be passionate and to let your emotion take you wherever your emotions take you. 
And that's a horrible thing, really. When we do our most stupid stuff is when we're emotional. But I'm not going to get into that. We don't do that stuff in, in this video, <laughs> right? I try to stay out of, I have plenty to stay, plenty to say outside of Trumpet. Um, I, I made it a policy. It's the same policy I have in my lessons. I don't talk about politics. I don't talk about um, any of that stuff in the lessons. Hello, James. I hope that makes sense. If you have emotional practice sessions instead of rational practice sessions, you will have struggles on stage with emotional stuff taking over, right? James asks, just wanted to say hello. Oh, howdy. No question from me today. Okay. Just learning by listening to everybody else. Well, that's good. Thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for hanging out with us. All right, so I'm out of time. Let me recapitulate real quick this emotional stuff. When you practice with a, 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 um, a proven practice technique, instead of just trying to get the notes, instead of just trying to play it right, you don't need passion. You don't need um, to be emotionally serious. You don't need any of that stuff. If you have, if you use proven practice techniques, then it becomes just business. If you've made a mistake, you already know what you're supposed to do about the mistake, and you're going to do it. There's no emotion involved. There's no judgment. There's no, and, and nothing like that. It's just business. It's, it's the same thing. It's, it should be, practicing should be just as boring as the boringest, most boring day job that you could possibly have. That's what practicing should be. You have a job to do. You're going to do the job. Okay. If you practice like that, instead of being passionate about your practice, then most of your stage fight problems will go away. I know this to be true because this I've, I've been teaching this long enough to see it in my students. The students that embrace this don't have trouble with stage fright. And the best of all those students that I'm talking about, the best example of that is my son. Right? He's like a cold fish on stage. <laughs> right? He just gets up there. I saw him play almost all of the Brandenburg Concerto. I mean, Brandenburg, not Brandenburg, what am I saying? Goldberg Variations on piano by memory. And he's like, oh, hum, you know, there's no, it's like no thing, nothing to him. He literally just plays it. He's like the coldest fish I've ever seen. And it's because of the way he practices. He practices the way I taught him to practice. And it's all mechanical. You do this, and whatever, if you make a mistake, there's a certain procedure you're supposed to follow. And you know, that there's beauty in that, right? You don't now have to put on a show of how much you care. Okay, you don't have to put on a show of how passionate you are about the music. And all of that stuff is just show, by the way. Because what it takes to actually play the horn is more mechanical. Save your passion for the performance that you put through the music. That's where the passion goes into the actual phrasing of the music, not into the process of practicing. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, we're out of time. Thank you guys for hanging out with me, and we will see you next week. All right? All right. See you next time. Bye. Thank you.